Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, so my name is Randy Lindo, and uh, on behalf of the Cl Clinton Climate Initiative and Partners in Project Green, I would like to welcome you to our monthly series of uh, free green technology webinars. Uh, today we're going to be featuring Kingspan Solar. Um, so just before we start the presentation, I'd just like to go over a few logistics. Um, so currently, uh, all your phone lines are muted, and it'll be muted throughout the entire webinar. Therefore, if you do have any questions, just please type them into the chat section. Uh, this is located at the bottom right hand uh, of your screen. And um, so that's it. Let's, let's begin. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, Declan Croucher. He is the Vice President of Kingspan Solar, and he's joining us from uh, Jessup, Maryland. Thanks, Randy. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yep, you're all good on this end. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Randy said, Declan Croucher from Kingspan Solar is my name. Um, uh, a topic that I'll be covering this afternoon, uh, you can see hopefully on your screen in front of you, I'll talk very briefly about the Kingspan Group, the Thermomax brand, uh, a couple of introductory slides on how solar hot water works and, and solar thermal collectors in general. I assume many of you, uh, by virtue of your interests, are familiar, but uh, just in case, I'll, I'll touch on those very, very briefly. I will then spend the, uh, the bulk of the time talking about our product, the Kingspan Thermomax Evacuated Tube Solar Collector. Uh, I'll also cover some commercial installation considerations. It's been expressed to me that many of the participants uh, are, are interested in that particular aspect of solar thermal, and we'll talk about some installation and, and in a little bit of detail on some case studies, then hopefully we will have more than uh, sufficient time for a wrap-up wrap and uh, further questions. Um, as Randy has mentioned, you can type uh, your questions in the bottom right-hand corner. I would ask, if you can, if you could um, uh, wait till I get through as, as, you know, the bulk of the presentation, certainly towards the latter half. if um, um, if you wish, but if there's something I've lost you on or you want me to go back on, please, you do say so. So with that, I'm just going to uh, uh, kick on here and go right into it. So the, the, the Kingspan Group, uh, the Kingspan Group was founded in Kingsport, Kingsport County Cabin in the northeast corner of Ireland in 1972. It started as a small family business, um, manufacturing some metal cladding and uh, roll formed structural sections for, for farmers' barns. Um, since then, it has expanded into uh, insulated panels, insulation products uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, got into access floors, um, and in the last decade in particular, has expanded into environmental and renewable products. The company is publicly closed in the Dublin and London stock exchanges, and in 2010, uh, reported revenue of US $1.8 billion. I've obviously converted that from from Euros. The Kickstarter Group is generally speaking considered to be you know, one of the, the leaders, particularly in high performance installation and energy saving building materials. Everything that we do, irrespective of the product division, is, is focused on helping building owners um, save money through uh, uh, by, sa by saving energy. Um, if you like it, we, many of you I'm sure are aware over. 70% of energy consumption is, is attributable to the built environment. Uh, across all of our divisions, um, uh, you know, our, our strategy is one of differentiation. So we look for proprietary technology or products that can drive, drive different differentiation and give us strong market positions, whether it's in a product sector uh, or market uh, or, or geographically. Uh, in terms of where the Kingspan Group operates. Our headquarters remain in Kingsport County Cabin, northeast corner of Ireland. But as a, you know, a multinational public quote, company, we're, we're more or less just a, an exporter at this point in time. Less than uh, about 5% of our global revenue is now derived from, from our home base. The bulk of it is that, not that far away from home, however. Britain and the UK, uh, Britain and Northern Ireland accounting for in excess of uh, 40%, uh, mainland Europe in the EU zone, uh, about 35%. But North America, inclusive of Canada and uh, the United States, uh, is about 17%. And indeed, that has been the fastest growing geographical 
market for it in recent years. We're, we're heavily exposed to the global uh, construction sector. Um, and uh, 2010 is In, in Canada, we've got a panel plant in Caledon, uh, which is relatively close, I believe, to most of the participants on this call, uh, as well as an access floor plant in, in Oakville, Ontario. And we also have facilities in British Columbia. The, the Thermomax brand then uh, has been around since, since 1981. Uh, it uh, was founded by a Dr. Farabors Majuri. Um, he set up plant, um, having worked as a professor in the, the Technical Institute in Berlin, he set up a plant in Northern Ireland, in fact, uh, and began to make the collectors commercially around that time. There, there's still, in fact, a, a track record of 1980s installations that are still in, still operational and in service today, and I'll show you the pictures of, of at least one of those uh, as we go through the presentation. The Thermomax brand was acquired by the King's Bank in 2007, at which point we redesigned the product and reinvested in both plant and manufacturing processes. And you can see a picture at the bottom right of the slide displaying for you of our new highly automated uh, evacuated tube manufacturing plant. There are in excess of 10 million tubes installed worldwide at this moment in time. And we hold all the major certifications from Solar Keymark in Europe to SRCC in the US, CSA in Canada, um, as well as a host of other certifications and design and product awards. Um, we're talking here about solar thermal, obviously, um, but I put this slide up because sometimes people uh, confuse photovoltaic with solar, solar thermal. So very briefly, uh, you know, photovoltaic, solar photovoltaic is essentially solar electric, converting solar energy into electricity, directly into electricity, which is then plugged into the grid or uh, the electric mill panel uh, in one's, uh, one's home or business. Solar thermal, on the other hand, um, you see a picture of our evacuated tube. Here, we're harnessing solar energy to generate heat, to heat hot water, which can then be used for um, a variety of applications. Again, very quickly for the benefit of those that may not be uh, familiar, uh, most solar thermal systems will be similar to this, whether it's residential or commercial, with, with some uh, subtle differences. But generally speaking, you've got a solar collector. Um, as, as indicated by the letter A here, on the, on the roof of a building. It can be ground mounted, but prim primarily on the roof. And it's plumbed by either copper or stainless steel piping to a heat exchanger, uh, which typically is connected to or is immersed within a solar storage tank. <coughs> Excuse me. When the sun shines on the collector and there's uh, energy available, and the, the temperature in the collector is higher than the temperature of the water in the tank, the controller, as denoted by uh, the letter S here, switches the pump on. Pump is B here in this illustration. Um, and the pump then circulates the heat transfer fluid through the collector um, to pick up the heat that's available. And it's then pumped uh, down to the lower uh, coil heat exchanger in the example here, as, as denoted by the letter C. In this case, it's in the bottom of, of a tank where it exchanges its heat uh, with the potable water. The pump then uh, circulates the cooler heat transfer fluid back up to the collector, and that process begins, or I should say, repeats itself over and over as long as there is energy to be, uh, to be harvested. Um, once the tank has achieved its target or maximum temperature, the collector shuts the pump off. In this particular example, what you see here is we've also got a, a backup boiler denominated by the letter D, which is connected to an upper coil uh, in the solar storage tank. And this is because <clears throat> there will be days when the sun doesn't shine or doesn't shine enough for the tank to get up to its target temperature, or in winter where you've got prolonged uh, periods where you're just not getting a significant contribution from your system. I won't go into details on the other components in here, but most solar thermal systems are, 
operate in this fashion, whether they're residential or uh, or commercial. So how can we use then the um, hot water that's generated? Well, domestic hot water is probably uh, the, the, the the major use here. So that's everything from um, you know showers, taps, tubs, dishwashers, washing machines, any situation within a home or a business um, where hot water is required. We can provide a significant proportion of that on an annualized basis. Swimming pools are another good application. They can be outdoor seasonal pools or they can be indoor year-round. The solar is an excellent application for, for swimming pools. Many of these applications can be used in concert with each other also. On the, the commercial, industrial, and agricultural side, the, the possibilities are endless. Everything from you know, hotels, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, office buildings, breweries, dairy farms, uh, manufacturing where you have uh, where you high temperature parts washing, laundromats, car washes. Any application where you have a, a high hot water demand or a requirement in particular for higher temperature water than we would use domestically. In addition, uh, space heating and cooling are also so possibilities. Uh, in some cases, in addition to domestic hot water, and we'll talk briefly about a couple of of those applications also as I go through the uh, the, the presentation. Uh, the types of solar collectors that we're talking about here are what we term medium temperature. So I'm excluding the, the utility scale or the, the you know, concentrated solar power uh, collectors that we often hear of. These are ones that are used on um, residences or on commercial buildings. The ones that you may have heard of or be most familiar with are, are pool collectors. Uh, these are generally limited in nature. They're used for, for outdoor seasonal pools. They're cost effective. They're relatively easy to install. And they're basically um, pieces of pipe with, uh, with plastic between them. Um, they can be installed easily, uh, even by a homeowner on a, on a, on a roof. Um, and they do a reasonable job uh, heating, in particular, seasonal outdoor pools. They're not glazed, uh, so you have very high heat loss to the environment. And unless the sun is shining strongly, they really don't uh, contribute a whole lot. The type of collectors that you may be most familiar with are, are flat plate collectors. Um, applications uh, in addition to domestic hot water are pools, uh, not just outdoor seasonal, but also indoor year-round. And they can also be used um, for supplemental heat, um, uh, on the floor radiant heating, or, or connecting in to um, some other type of space heating system. They're, they're, they're simple uh, in terms of their design. I mean, essentially, you've got an absorber plate uh, covered by a sheet of glass with um, with insulation on the back. Uh, they're well known and recognized. Um, they've been, you know, it's very well settled technology. They've been around for a long time. And they do a, they do a good job in, in, you know, in many applications and can provide a good, good payback. Because of the nature of their design and construction, they, they tend not to perform well in cloudy weather. They rely heavily on direct sunlight. Uh, but, and, and also they're affected by environmental conditions. So if the if the outside air temperature is lower than the, um, than the collector, um, you're going to get a lot of heat loss. Um, it's a bit like taking a, a cup of coffee outside on a cold day. You will rapidly lose the heat that, that's in that cup because it's, it's not feeling from the environment. Um, and very often, uh, unless it's a very well-made product, um, over time, uh, you, know, you will have condensation where moisture gets in. They're particularly prone to this in humid or marine environments, and, and that can, in the long term, cause um, cause freezing and, and cracking, uh, which affects their uh, uh, their longevity. But um, flat plate collectors do you know, do a very good job in, in many situations or, or applications. Evacuated tube collectors can can be used for the same range of applications, uh, but they're also suited to uh, higher temperature process heat. And, and the reason for that is um, you will simply get more output from them than a, a, um, than a comparable flat plate collector. In most applications, you're going to get your highest efficiency from, from an evacuated tube solar collector, irrespective of the manufacturer. Um, they, they perform relatively better in cloudy weather because they're not as reliant uh, on direct sunlight. They're tubular in nature, so they also take advantage of diffuse light. Um, 
and their performance is not affected by the environment. Uh, we'll talk a bit about how they're designed and manufactured, but essentially, as the name suggests, um, they're in a vacuum, so they're completely sealed from the environment, so you do not have the same heat loss associated with um, uh, the flat panel collectors. Because of their nature, um, they're modular, they can be installed relatively easily, uh, literally tube by tube if necessary. And this can become important on large commercial. on the building, uh, whereas with a, a, a comparable size flat panel, sometimes it, it can act a little, a little bit like a sail um, right, from a wind load perspective. Some of the disadvantages uh, associated with them, typically they are more expensive than, um, than flat plate uh, technology, so the, the initial investment can be higher, uh, but generally speaking, a sense as to how, how it operates. Inside the glass, you have a, a, a copper absorber plate, uh, and that's covered with a, um, a blue tinox selective coating um, for um, uh, from, from max, maximum uh, uh, absorbance of the, the available energy in excess of, uh, of 95%. of demineralized water um, uh, uh, sitting at the bottom of that tube. Um, during the manufacturing process, a vacuum is pulled uh, from both the heat pipe as well as the tube itself, down to about 10 to the minus 6 uh, uh, mic microbar, which our R&D people tell me is, is equivalent to that in, in outer space uh, for what it's worth. Um, um, but it is a very low permeability to hydrogen um, and helium, which helps us preserve the vacuum for the, the design life of the product. It's one of the reasons why we're the only solar thermal manufacturer out there that offers a 20-year warranty uh, on, our, um, on our evacuated tubes. Um, at the bottom, during the, you've got a rubber end bumper, which simply protects uh, the, the, the tube during installation, um, and that is clear. that the vacuum remains intact. So from a maintenance perspective, as long as you've got a portion of the silver barium getter, and this is easily identifiable by walking behind the collectors, um, the vacuum is fully intact and the, and the product is operating. The, underneath the black cap, as we get towards the, the extreme right-hand side of the, um, uh, of, of the illustration here, is a
move to the right through a flexible neck which allows uh, for easy installation because it is six feet long. And it also means that um, uh, during its lifetime, in particular if it's on a, on a, on a large uh, commercial building where you're going to have wind, etc., that the, you know, the product can, if you like, burn in the wind. I don't mean that uh, literally. But you've got, um, um, you're not stressing the, uh, the gas to metal seal. And then it finishes at the condenser head um, where the, um, uh, the where it transfers its heat to the um, uh, to the manifold. Now I'll show you the manifold on the next slide. So what you've got is a picture of the manifold on the bottom of this slide with the um, with the top cover removed. So you've got the tubes there. Obviously, you can see the the, the, uh, the blue absorber plate. They connect into the chamber of the manifold by a simple uh, it's a kind of a plug and And the heat transfer fluid that I mentioned uh, in the earlier slide flows around, uh, around underneath um, and on top of the, the condenser head. If we were to remove one or more of those tubes for whatever reason, replacement, servicing, um, the heat transfer fluid does not, uh, does not leak out. So it's a, what we call a dry system. The heat transfer fluid is completely Degree angle. The reason for that is we want that fluid uh, in the heat pipe um, to travel upwards towards the condenser head. Um, because of the vacuum, it, it's going to boil at around, uh, I believe it's about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so it'll quickly turn. You now have the steam uh, which has traveled into the condenser head. As I go to the next slide, it then cools down once it hits the condenser head uh, because it has begun to transfer its heat to the heat transfer fluid which is passing around, across, over, and underneath us. The, in this case, in our case, it's a propylene glycol. pipe, all the while uh, the heat is being transferred um, to the, um, the transfer fluid in the, uh, in the chamber uh, until such time as all of it, the heat has been transferred. And once again, as long as the sun's energy is available, that process just repeats itself uh, over and over again. A um, couple of things I'd like to point out before I move off uh, just this section, you'll see a uh, in the top of the condenser head here, what looks like a series of discs. Um, this is a patented temperature limit. from uh, being transferred uh, directly into the manifold. You will still get some conduction. Um, and the, the importance of this will hopefully become apparent when we talk about um, some of the other installation considerations in a, uh, 
in a few slides. What this essentially does is it's an added protection mechanism because evacuated tube products in particular are so efficient, it's very important that we, um, that we don't let the, uh, the system what we call stagnate. And that is where we've produced more energy than is being used because we can't turn the sun off. Um, and the product is still absorbing, absorbing temperatures. Temperatures in the manifold can often get up to as high as 450 degrees Fahrenheit. So in order to preserve the, um, uh, the system for its design life, we want to minimize those type of circumstances. So this is one feature. It's not the only that, that contributes towards that. This in particular is useful if you've got a temporary power outage or a pump failure or something like that. Uh, it's not something that we rely on for the long term protection of the system. Uh, so, getting into some installations and some other uh, some other issues. Uh, was thought back in nineteen eighty four. So that's certainly 26 years, probably going on 27 years at this point in time. Um, we know it's 1984 because the old Thermax Limited stopped making 15 tube manifolds in 1984. Um, top left is what we would consider to be a typical residential system, and I provide this picture so you can get a sense as to the kind of the, the footprint, if you like. Uh, this, this installation dates back to the. Um, the 1990s, it's in Columbia, Maryland, relatively close to, um, to, where we, uh, uh, to where we're based. Bottom left is a 20-tube system, uh, which was installed in Texas, uh, in a lot of sunlight in Texas. So, of, um, you know, from you know, the, the middle of the U.S. heating, um, and you can see the different types of mounting, roof mounted, float roof, and in this case, um, uh, flat roof mounting. On the, on the right, what we consider to be the light commercial side, uh, on the top you've got a, you've got a fast food restaurant, uh, this just happens to be three collectors, and hopefully the image is somewhat uh, um, uh, distinguishable for you, but in this particular case, they're also using the collectors as, as almost an awning over the front of the store. And then the, um, uh, the, the restaurant owner, it's not visible here, this was new construction, has a sign outside, you know, hot water in this restaurant, um, you brought to you. The, the one on the bottom is one that's, uh, I'm not familiar with the specific installation myself, but um, um, it's certainly in Ontario's Nationville Dairy Farm. Um, this was a six collector uh, system that was installed in uh, 2008, I believe, late 2008. Um, I'm not beg your pardon, uh, it was the summer of 2008. That, th that this was installed uh, in this dairy farm, and it's applying high temperature hot water for Um, there's two years of data now available on this particular installation, and, and it looks like the performance um, is uh, in, in excess, is up to 40% in excess of what was uh, what was predicted. We suspect it's due to the um, 
for efficiency of the um, the system that they had there previously. It's my understanding that it was uh, propane based. Current system is now um, uh, solar thermal with, with backup electrical uh, electrical heat. Solar fraction, meaning the percentage of annualized hot water that's been provided by this installation uh, for um, for 2000 and uh, for 2008 to 2009 and 2009 to 2010 is, um, is about 66 percent, so pretty much close to, um, to two thirds. Uh, I don't have pricing for you because we're, we're the manufacturer, but what we're told is that um, the payback on this system was, was being projected at four and a half years. Uh, that was inclusive of incentives at that time, uh, but based on the performance, they, they expect to, uh, to shave that uh, considerably. Without incentives, exclusive of grants, I believe it was, um, it was about eight years was the, uh, the projected, projected payback. Uh, on the large commercial side, then, just to kind of give you a sense as to the scale, um, you know, everything from a 22 residential collector to um, probably today our largest uh, uh, installation worldwide, and that's uh, Changi Airport outside Singapore. And this has been installed uh, in, in stages over time, uh, but currently it, it's up to about, um, uh, you know, close to uh, close to 485. Collectors at this. Uh, I haven't been to the airport myself, but uh, it's my understanding that it's um, that, that it's huge um, and it's providing a lot of the hot water for bathrooms and, and uh, restaurant facilities, um, and a kitchen building at that airport. Uh, I am told that we do have one coming in China. Um, I believe it's in the, it may be Nanjing that that may surpass this um, in the next couple of years. Uh, closer to home, we've got the, the Roosevelt Aquatic Center, uh, which is in Sacramento, California. I've been to this facility myself. Uh, on this one, there are 90 uh, collectors installed um, and uh, uh, you know, providing heat for the swimming pool uh, itself. It's also providing domestic hot water for the bits and meeting facilities. They've got obviously locker rooms and staff facilities there. And, and it also uh, contributes during the winter months um, to some solar, um, big barn, to some space heating. Uh, it's a very impressive facility um, with an architect involved in the design, as you can possibly tell. Um, and they, uh, they're using a portion of the system, this isn't the entire system, as a sort of a shade or an awning or a, a parking lot area adjoining the, um, the facility. Um, this is new construction, so we don't necessarily have a, 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 a payback uh, for this particular system. What we do know from the city is that um, they spend about 5,000 US dollars a month less in natural gas uh, at this facility than they do um, at, at a comparable facility um, elsewhere in the city. Now, that's not all attributable to the solar thermal system. We do have some other unique things going on there, passive heating and passive dehumidification and so on. But, but nonetheless, they're very happy with this. Um, and um, uh, we've actually brought visitors and even investors uh, to that facility to, uh, to show it to them. Uh, closer to home to most of the participants on this call is the Trudeau Davidson Acres living, assisted living facility um, that's in, that's in the, the greater Toronto area. That is. Um, it's uh, 37 collectors, and they were just installed. Um, I believe the installation was completed um, in, in November or December uh, of last year. So we, we do not, as of yet, have um, you know the, the data that we can um, um, uh, get permission to make, make available. It is my understanding, however, that the, the solar fraction, the percentage of the um, annual hot water demand that's been provided by the collectors um, is about 32%. So in this particular case, about a third of the, the, uh, the annual uh, hot water demand is being provided uh, by, the, by the solar thermal system. Um, you notice some of the different uh, mounting uh, mechanisms in terms of what you can see, and I'll talk about these here in a, in a moment. I need to kind of move on to stay on time. Um, so some of that, uh, some of the commercial installation considerations uh, 
that, that one would need to take into account, you know, the, first of all, the system sizing. Uh, unlike a regular hot water system, we're not typically trying to size um, to meet the entire hot water demand or load in a given year. Um, generally speaking, we're looking at somewhere between 30 and 80 percent. Um, and, and there are a number of reasons for this, but as I'm sure you can appreciate, you know, we get more sun and sunlight in the summer and less in the winter. If we size a system based on winter output, we would potentially end up oversizing it uh, for the summer. So on the one hand, we're wasting energy, uh, but on the other hand, what we're doing is um, we're creating another set of issues. How do we protect the system um, when it's, uh, because the, you know, collectors are like, they're like a boiler on the roof and the sun is shining and can't turn them off. Um, they cannot be simply removed. Uh, so system sizing is a very, very important aspect, and, and generally speaking, we're, we're trying to figure out what the demand is. We can do it by measurement, generally speaking, in a retrofit type application where we would use, you know, ultrasonic fuel meters, temperature sensors, and we can figure out exactly what that facility is using. Uh, in the construction, we're more likely to have to uh, to, re to resort to, um, to estimation. Uh, there are some, you know, uh, good rules of thumb that are out there. Uh, from bodies like ASHRAE and others uh, for commercial applications. So with, with reasonable degree of accuracy, once we know the purpose, um, you know, whether it's an apartment building, whether it's a restaurant, um, you know, a full service restaurant or quick service, whether it's a school or a hotel, we can figure out what the, um, uh, what the demand is likely to be. Uh, roof area and, and collected layout are very important. Um, we need to avoid um, you know, shading, uh, we need to provide access um, uh, to, the, to the collectors for, for search and monitoring and for service. Um, uh, shading will obviously reduce the, um, uh, the system output. Sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll take that compromise, um, but we need to be very mindful of that. Um, in many commercial applications, um, the, the limiting factor is actually the roof area that's available to us. Um, it's not necessarily that our target solar fraction is, is more or less than what we actually achieve. It's that we simply can't safely fit any more collectors on the roof. Uh, structural loads is an important consideration, even though evacuated tubes uh, you know, uh, are, are, are probably better suited in some circumstances where you've got wind really load issues in, than flat panels. Still, even though the dead weight of the collector itself is only about 170 pounds, it's probably 190, 180, 190, when the, the collector is full, the you know, wind loads can add up to 10 times that. Um, you know, so we've got to be cognizant of things like roof slope, composition of the roof, you know, the number of penetrations, uh, and, and you know, the roof warranty. Um, uh, you know, balance mode systems can be used in some circumstances. In a couple of the other examples, in particular the uh, True Davidson example that I put up there, there's a kind of a, a, a grillage system uh, which was designed and used um, that minimizes the, the number of uh, penetrations and attachments that you need, uh, but spreads the, spread the load safely. Obviously, that adds um, you know, cost and complexity to larger commercial systems. Uh, storage tanks, uh, another issue. Um, we need to size those appropriately, and we need to take account of uh, the peaks and troughs of, um, uh, of of the demand. Your requirement for a storage tank and the size of the tank will vary from an apartment building where you're likely to have people a heavy peak demand in the morning, as opposed to an office building where you may have a heavy demand, but it's it's distributed throughout the day. Um, and that can, we can often be looking at anywhere between 40 and 80 gallons of storage um, per, um, uh, per collector. So uh, that obviously adds cost as well. Uh, then you're talking about other you know, balance of system components. I'm not going to go into detail here, but you know, you're talking about things like uh, you know, uh, uh, the type of pump station uh, and, and uh, uh, the piping that you're going to use, the control strategy. You know, is it going to be a standalone? Uh, controller, um, or does it require some form of uh, programmable, programmable logic, excuse me, or is this going to be controlled by an existing building management system? So they're all, uh, they're all factors. I mentioned earlier that, um, that every system is going to require 100% you know, backup. Um, you know, your, your minimum contribution from any solar thermal system you know, could be zero. 
So at all times, the building needs to meet its peak load, so we still need a full backup. And that rubber heater won't work as hard or as frequently um, uh, as if it was providing all of the hot water demand. However, we need to be mindful of a number of things. Um, it's going to be handling much higher temperatures, uh, in particular with evacuated tube systems. So, you know, ideally, we need to be mindful of the uh, the type of the type of storage tank stainless steel is is, is good because it, it can handle those higher those higher temperatures. Or if it's going to be carbon steel, we're looking at some other type of lining um, uh, that uh, that can handle those type of temperatures. Uh, I briefly mentioned uh, stagnation of heat dissipation earlier. This is an important consideration, um, and uh, you know we will be producing energy as long as. Uh, you know, the sun is shining or there's daylight available. Um, uh, the tank will have a, a target temperature or a maximum temperature, uh, at which point the, the TMP valve will, um, you know, will kick in. So it's important that we, uh, we, we protect the tanks. Um, if the tank is satisfied, the pump will turn off the, um, the controller will turn off the pump and the system. Um, so, you know, ideally we want to either size the system so we never, um, hit that situation, but sometimes you can't tell, uh, as in a university, for example, you may be years where a, a residence is not, uh, they don't have the same level of, um, uh, of occupancy. So we want to be sure that either we've got some form of a diverter valve um, uh, in the event that the tank is satisfied so we can dissipate that heat, or we've got a secondary load, such as um, you know, a cooling tower, or uh, maybe there's a uh, you know, maybe there's a pool in the facility or an AEC reheat facility. Um, and if not, we will have to come up with some form of a, uh, a heat dump in order to, um, to dissipate that energy and, and protect the system and, and ensure that, it's, um, that it lasts for, for, for its design lifetime. Uh, because one of the issues is the heat transfer fluid, the glycol, will, um, uh, will begin to break down at those elevated temperatures if it's not... Uh, if it's not protected, uh, and that can affect the, the performance as well as the, uh, the longevity of the system. Uh, in terms of freeze protection, then, you know, for the most part, we're talking about either glycol-based systems, which we, we recommend, uh, or, or some manufacturers or contractors uh, favor drainback. Drainback really doesn't suit, in our opinion, um, large commercial installations because you're you're relying on both gravity, which brings its own installation challenges, um, as well as you know, as well as sensors um, to, uh, to pump water out of the system uh, when, when it's freezing. And uh, if that fails, well, then you're, you're potentially in trouble. So I go, this is a favorite approach from our perspective, in particular for commercial buildings. Uh, but it's not without its disadvantages or problems either. It does have to be monitored and maintained. Um, so recently, large commercial systems then that we've done, uh, just to give you a kind of a flavor, on the top, we've got the Texas A&M University in Kingsville, Texas. This is 66 uh, uh, collectors flying domestic hot water to this uh, new construction uh, student, student residence, uh, Texas A&M. Uh, this just recently been completed, so I do not have a lot of details as of yet about its output. I do know that uh, the, the, the contractor was telling us that the projected payback on the system was in the... Um, uh, you know, somewhere in the 12 to 15, uh, uh, the 12 to 15 year range, based on their uh, based on their calculations and comparisons to uh, 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 equivalent systems already on um, uh, on campus. But uh, that's, and that's without any incentives, um, because I presume uh, it's a public building in, in many cases in the United States. Um, uh, nonprofits, public, are not public publicly funded. Institutions are not able to avail of incentives. Uh, in the middle here is one that was recently completed close to our facility, George Washington University. Uh, this was 90, 90 collectors. This was um, a very interesting one. Uh, once it was installed in the George Washington University, this was a solar thermal power purchase agreement. So it was installed, it was designed, uh, developed, and, and funded um, uh, by a company uh, that was essentially acting as a developer that is then selling the energy that's generated to the university um, at a fixed discount over what they otherwise would have paid um, for natural gas. I believe it's probably a, um, 
15 to 20 year contract um, and obviously the developer or investor because they own, operate and maintain the system can then avail themselves of the various, um, the various incentives, both federal uh, as well as state and Um, I've got a little bit of a type so there they're not providing cooling but they're powering uh, climate well uh, chillers that are um, uh, providing um, cooling to, to that building I believe you Hot water heating and cooling is um, uh, is about fifty six percent. On the domestic hot water side, it's it, it, it could be as high as uh, as ninety percent um, because obviously cooling is not required um, uh, year round. Um, So quickly, um, and uh, probably not as quick as I anticipated. Are, are there any questions? Um, I'm scrolling through here. Any questions that I can answer for anybody? Okay, I've got a question here. Um, Sheena, can can you? In many situations, the answer to that question is that the effect on the lifespan of the water heater, you know, in our opinion, it, it prolongs the um, uh, the life of the, the existing water heater because if it's only working now for 30% um, of the time, shall we say, as opposed to 100% um, of the time, uh, well then it, it should lengthen its lifespan. Yes, but obviously every every situation uh, is different in in. Uh, in some cases, it's, it's better. It's better to to replace. Uh, the question from Rajan is, you know, what is the typical payback uh, for a solar hot water system in Toronto weather for domestic hot water heating in a, in a, in a commercial building? Um, it, uh, the answer to that question is it, it depends. It depends on, on a number of factors. It depends on the, 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 the current fuel source and the, and the price being paid for that. There's a hundred thousand dollars in roof structural work that has to be done. Now that does affect, obviously, the uh, the payback of the system. We we have seen 
paybacks in the northern regions that can range from 3%, uh, a big part from three years, you know, frankly, up to 15 years or even longer. Um, the follow-up question uh, from, um, uh, from Najan, are there, are there grants available? Um, with respect to the um, uh, to, 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 to Ontario, the, the answer was that there, there were uh, up until the end of um, uh, 2010. I, I, I certainly know that the Show Life Hospital uh, was one that was in receipt of our grant. I cannot speak definitively for um, the, the, the True Davidson. It is, however, my understanding from some of our partners in the, in the Canadian market and in Toronto that, um, that, that the incentives are to, be, uh, are, to be, are to be brought back in. Um, the, another follow-up question from, from Ryan uh, is in response to the, the Toronto system is uh, you know, natural gas is the, is, is the fuel source. You know, for, as I said earlier, look, it can be anywhere from, from frankly, three years to 15 years, and, and that is inclusive of, of uh, you know, of grants. The, the system, the Nationville Dairy Farm, had a projected uh, payback of four and a half years, um, eight years with, without any grants, the lower eight years without any grants. Uh, we're told the performance of that system is such that, uh, that those paybacks will come down. I realize that's not the greater Toronto area, but um, certainly it's, it's, it's Ontario. Um, what we see, and I realize it's not necessarily of, of interest to everybody on this, on, on this call, but um, um, that's about the range that we also see in, uh, in, in the United States. That can vary from state to state depending on the incentives, but um, uh, you know, commercial installations can be you know, three to three to fifteen years. It is a, it is a wide uh, a wide range, certainly. Any any other questions? We're we're about out of time, as I understand it. So I don't see anybody else typing at this point in time. So, uh, Randy, at this point, I think I'll just uh, hand it back to you. Okay, so yeah, just uh, before we close out the presentation here, I'd just like to thank you, uh, Declan, for the presentation today and for everyone who's joined us on the call. Um, if, if there's anyone else who'd like to know more about Kingspan Solar or interested in finding out more about the product discounts um, that are provided through the Clinton Climate Initiative, we will be sending out contact information uh, within the next few days. And um, so our next free green technology webinar, that's scheduled for September 15th as well. And details on that presentation will, will follow in the next uh, coming weeks. Uh, so again, yeah, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And um, have a great weekend.